thank you, Kathy, for that introduction. And um, on behalf of my co-authors, Jack Maley and John Silva, we'd like to thank ACI for this great honor. Um, this is a paper is a small part of a larger effort to try to harmonize the design of steel structures and concrete structures, and especially looking at the connections between those two types of members. Um, so I'm glad I'll be able to share a little bit about our research on this topic. Uh, so my name is Ben Worsfold. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. And I'm going to talk to you about shear reinforced concrete breakout failures. Uh, some of you might be familiar with concrete breakout failures, but if you're not, uh, this is what you, it could look like. If you cast an anchor into concrete, this is a headed anchor, and you then pull on that anchor hard enough, eventually you will break the concrete and rip out a chunk of it, and it's often in the shape of a cone. So this failure is sometimes called cone failure or breakout cone failure. Uh, this has been studied quite extensively for small anchors, so just a few inches deep, everything that's holding up all the lighting above our heads, for example. But there's been quite an outstanding question for some time, which is, is breakout failure relevant for large-scale connections involving groups of anchors or groups of reinforcing bars? So, for example, what happens when you have a brace anchored into your concrete foundation? Is breakout important there or not? What about corbels and the longitudinal bars here? How well anchored do the corbel bars need to be into the column and could they break out? Uh, what about connections from columns to foundations where the column longitudinal bars anchor into the foundations with 90 degree hooks? Is breakout something we need to think about or not? It, uh, uh, historically, it hasn't been something we've thought about too much. Uh, what about a case like this, a coupling beam with diagonally reinforced bars? What will happen when these groups of diagonal bars are anchored into thin, uh, into thin shear walls? Is breakout important there or not? Some of the first tests that were done on this were performed at Purdue a few years ago, where um, instigated by a particular detail uh, it's common in the nuclear industry. They ran some tests where they had groups of straight bars cast into concrete, and the length of these bars was chosen to be the development length. And so you can see in this example, this is a group of five by five bars, so 25 bars total welded to a plate, and a cast a development length into the concrete, and they pulled on that. Um, if you trust our current codes, you would think that you'd be able to pull on that plate until the bars yield. That's what development length should give you. But I'll give you a second to think, what do you think happened in these tests? And it should be a giveaway that this is a breakout talk. So they saw breakout type failures uh, way before the bars yielded, which was very concerning because a lot of the anchoring details I showed you on the previous slide engineers have often relied solely on development length provisions to know how far these elements should anchor into each other. Uh, but these were some of the first tests to show that in some cases development length is not enough. When you have many bars close together anchoring into shallow members, development length might not be sufficient. Uh, some other tests were run, these are run at Taiwan, looking at concrete columns to concrete foundation connections. Uh, where the longitudinal bars from the columns for this specimen terminated in heads. And so we loaded the, col the column was loaded laterally, and we also saw breakout failures in the foundation. Here you're seeing overlapping concrete cones from the two sides of the specimen. That's why we get this like W-shaped failure, W-shaped cracks in the foundation. Uh, so this is quite concerning for a lot of people because it's not something we generally think about. It's definitely not something that I'd ever been taught in school could happen. Um, even though, uh, so this is something that had been recognized in the previous versions of the building code. Um, but from these physical tests, we learned that breakout failure can govern for large scale, scale connections, even when development links are provided. Um, and the current 2019 version of ACI recognized this, and I'll read the highlighted section. It says, 
if reinforcement is used as anchorage, concrete break breakout failure shall be considered. But then no guidance beyond that as to how to consider it or what conditions it might be important. Um, another observation from these physical tests is that the breakout equations in chapter 17 can be quite conservative in some cases. If, you're, if you've had to use them in the past, you're probably well aware of how conservative they could be. Um, for example, in one of our tests, the peak anchor load we observed was about 250 kips, whereas the design strength is only 77 with a ratio of about three. Um, there's different sources for this conservatism. One of them is that the current breakout equations in the code are intentionally calibrated to a low 5% fractile strength, not to a median strength, um, which is common in some other equations in the building code. There are different reasons for that, historic reasons why these equations are intentionally calibrated low. Uh, one of them is that there are cases where we have what we'd call single point fastenings, where if this one anchor fails, the whole thing's coming down. So we need high safety factors for these connections. But then there are many other connections where that might not be the case, where if one connection starts to fail, forces could redistribute. Uh, but the current code punishes all of these anchored connections equally. We're assuming single point fastenings for all. Another reason there is conservatism in the current equations is that any reinforcement is not included in the breakout strengths. The current equations assume you're anchoring into plain concrete. Um, adding reinforcement intuitively would make sense that that would strengthen your connection, but there was no guidance as to by how much could your connection increase in strength. Could you double your connection strength, or is it just like a 5% increase? No, Not much guidance as to how to place this reinforcement, where does it need to be located relative to your anchor. Um, the only way the current codes recognize the interaction of reinforcement with your anchors is with the concept of anchor reinforcement, where if you place reinforcement in this, like the blue bars, which are upside down U shape, if you place these bars, you can then ignore the concrete breakout strength and simply use these as like a lap splice. So you're transferring the force directly from the anchors into the bars, but then uh, the concrete strength is ignored. You have to take one or the other, the concrete strength or the steel strength. Uh, but that's when we started to think, well, why shouldn't we be able to add two together? You calculate your concrete strength. If it's not sufficient, you can add steel reinforcement in a certain configuration and add these two contributions together. So that's the main effort behind this, behind this work. But that brings up a bunch of questions. Well, what would the detailing requirements be? How do these bars need to be anchored to be efficient? Where should they be placed? What's the size of the region around the anchors where we need to place reinforcement? And then are there any upper limits to this? Can I just keep adding more and more steel to a connection and continue expecting the strength to increase? So to look into this problem, we ran a series of physical tests. I'm showing uh, one example of some of the tests we ran at Berkeley where we have our foundation slab with a group of anchors cast into it. Um, it's sitting on a ring of supports. We call it Stonehenge because that's what it looked like in the lab. So we have steel Stonehenge, this big slab sitting on top, and then the anchors were pulled out from underneath. And I'm going to do something you shouldn't do in a presentation, which is try to play a video and hope it works. And it works. Great. So this is a video from underneath the slab. We're pulling down on this group of anchors. You'll start to see flexural cracks emanating from the anchor group. And then you'll see the breakout happen as the bars pull out a chunk of concrete. Um, for this series of tests, we were looking at different placements and configurations of shear reinforcing. Uh, so we had one specimen without shear reinforcement, and then different placements of, of hooks and bars, looking at different densities of shear reinforcement. Um, this is a plot showing the load displacement curves for the four specimens we tested. The control specimen is the lowest strength. You can see it'll reach um, its peak, and then we have a sudden brittle failure because there's no shear reinforcement to hold the breakout cone together. But for all other three specimens, we were able to more than double the connection strength just by adding normal grade 60 
bars. There's no special materials here. Um, if we look at the cross sections for these different specimens, here at the bottom, you can see the breakout cone is the kind of the standard cone shape you might expect. It's a single cone, so because there's no shear reinforcement in those. But in all the other three cases where we've added shear reinforcing, distributed shear reinforcing, we're getting nested, oh, sorry about that, we're getting nested cone failures, and so the stress distribution becomes very different when you start to add shear reinforcing to these connections. Um, even on the specimen on the top, you might be able to see that each anchor rod itself formed a really steep cone, and each anchor failed with its individual cone. Um, so that starts to give us some hints as to what the upper limits of adding shear reinforcement might be, because other failure modes will start to trigger other failure modes as we add the shear reinforcement. So those tests were run on pure tension connections. This is another series of tests that we ran on moment connections. So we have our steel column it's anchored into our concrete foundation. You can see the shear reinforcement in this case, we were using what we've been calling candy cane bars, like a 180 degree hook on top and then a head at the bottom. And these uh, reinforcing bars were just hanging from the intersections of longitudinal bars, um, which we, I've seen in detailing, especially when you're detailing foundations and trying to add shear reinforcing to foundations. So it's not a new type of detail, but it has been used before. Um, so this particular specimen, we're loading it, the column, laterally looking at a connection governed by moment transfer. And this should be another video, there we go, where it's, this is a cyclic loading test, we're increasing the displacements as we go. Uh, you can see the anchors on each side, the, the green blocks you might see there are the load cells, we had a load cell on each anchor. And eventually, towards the end, you'll start to see the breakout failure as the cones start to rip out. Maybe I can... Anyway, let's play it again. Uh, so if you look at the top surface of the slab, you'll start to see cracks, circumferential cracks around the connection, showing us where the concrete cones are being pulled out of, of the slab. And here on the top right, I'm showing the load to column drift ratio plot, comparing two specimens. The darker line is for the specimen with no shear reinforcement, where we have a sudden drop in strength, whereas the lighter lines in the background um, show that we were able to increase the strength by about 50%, but also interestingly, we were able to increase the displacement capacity by a factor of about three, which is also significant, especially in seismic regions. Um, once we cut a cross-section through the specimen to, un to look at the crack patterns and try to understand what was going on, you'll see at the top that we had a failure cone on the left, that's our blue cone, located fully within the region where we had shear reinforcing. Um, if you notice, the left side of the specimen, we reinforced a larger region than on the right. Um, on the right side, the reinforcing ended a little sooner, and you can see that the governing breakout cone on the right actually extended outside that region, beyond where what reinforced. Um, so again, this is giving us clues as to what size of a region around the connection needs to be reinforced for these bars to be effective. <laughs> Uh, this is a plot showing the strain of each reinforcing bar at failure uh, in the y-axis. The x-axis is the distance that bar is from your anchored connection. So as you would expect, the farther away you get from your anchors, the, the strain in these bars drops. Uh, but the important point to note is that bars that are within about 0.75 h-effective, h-effective being the, the embedment depth of the anchor, those bars were able to, for the most part, yield and go well beyond yield. Um, we use these uh, physical test data to run some uh, calibration models and try to explore other details and other connections. I'm not going to spend much time talking about that today. We have a separate paper discussing uh, the, the simulation side. But I wanted to go back to uh, the model that I mentioned at the beginning. So the purpose behind this was to try to develop a model where we could calculate the nominal 
anchor strength for shear reinforced breakout by calculating a concrete strength NC and then adding a new term NS, which would have to do with the steel reinforcing. Um, and just about a month ago, uh, this equation passed in ACI 318, so it should be in the new building code for engineers to use, and we're really excited about that. But let me show you what it looks like. Uh, so the NC term, the mean concrete breakout st strength, what, we're pro what we've proposed and what is passed is to take the concrete breakout strength from chapter 17 and just bump that up to a mean level, not use the 5% fractile level. Um, and based on uh, dis strength distributions that we can get from literature, the factor would be 1.33. And so that will bring us up to a mean value for the concrete strength. Now, for the steel contribution, if I imagine an anchor placed in a region with distributed shear reinforcement, I might expect the stress distribution in those bars to follow some type of, some type of bell curve, where the bars close to the anchors are feeling the most stress, and that would drop off. Um, but for the ease of calculation, we're, we propose uh, we'll substitute that uh, bell shape for a rectangular shape of equal area, of equal force, assuming that the bars in this region are all going to reach their nominal yield strength. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that all the bars within that area will yield, it's just for ease of calculation to account for the effect of all the bars around it and even outside of this area. And we're calling this the effective area of our anchors. So this is an example of if you have three anchors in a line, your effective area would be an offset 0.75 H effective, H effective being the depth of the anchor into the member, and that would give you your effective area. And the simple equation we've proposed to calculate the strength contribution due to steel is shown here, where you would take the effective area around your anchors, multiply times the shear reinforcing ratio, that would give you an area of steel in square inches, then you multiply times the nominal yield stress to give you a force, and that would be the force that you add to your plain concrete strength. Um, it's a simple model, but does it work? So if we look at uh, tests done by previous researchers and tests done uh, by us, we can plot on the x-axis is the increase in strength that you would expect from this theoretical equation. And in the vertical axis, we're showing the measured increase in strength uh, observed in the lab. And the data points seem to follow the one-to-one -one line, meaning that this equation uh, generally tends to follow the same trend from the data that we have. Uh, if I then plot the strength um, ratios here, where this is the strength measured in the test divided by the nominal strength from this new equation, we get the distribution that you see here, where the data points seem to hover around one. Uh, you might think that some of the higher data points, like these gray X's over here, uh, might be a bit conservative, because we have a ratio that might be close to 1.4 or something. But with the current code, we would have a ratio of about three. So we're cutting down on the conservatism that some of these connections um, would, uh, you would you would get from the current equations. Um, some of the data points fall below one, but remember, we still need to add in a fee factor here that should easily accommodate for those, those lower points. Um, in the proposal that went through in ACI 318, there are detailing requirements to try to describe the secondary failure modes that you might trigger by adding shear reinforcing. I, there are some details accounting for spacing of the shear reinforcing bars. If their shear reinforcing bars are very far apart from each other, you could have a breakout cone occur between adjacent bars. So there's limits to how far bars can be apart. Um, and there's detailing requirements for how deep those bars need to go and the anchoring of those the ends of the shear reinforcing bars to ensure that they yield because this equation assumes that those bars will be able to yield. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and I'd be glad to answer any questions. <laughs>